pray in this manner. Matthew chapter 9 or chapter 6 verses 9 to 15. The Lord's Prayer. We have studied this more than a year ago. In fact, two years, two and a half years ago during our prayer meeting. We had a series of 13 messages on the Lord's Prayer. And it is a good reminder as we would come again and look at the Lord's Prayer once again so that the people of God, those who have missed this study during the prayer meeting, may benefit from it. The Lord's Prayer is the pattern for prayer. A uh, pattern is an original or model considered for or deserve our learning or imitation. And the word aptly used by the King James translator is the manner. We are to pray in this manner, Jesus says in verse 9, after this manner, Pray ye, signifying the way or method or approach to prayer. How shall we pray? What shall we pray? A prayer filled, prayer full life is the strongest assurance for the believer to live a victorious Christian life against the world against the onslaught of the evil one and against this flesh that seeks always to pull us down. Just as we are asked to put on the whole armour of God. You remember uh, we were studying the book of Ephesians and Paul says put on the whole armour of God that you may be protected from every spiritual assault, every spiritual warfare. And the Apostle Paul asked that we would pray with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. What does it mean to pray with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit? Well, it is this, what our Lord taught concerning how we can fortify ourselves, protect ourselves and live this life receiving God's blessing. Our memory verse, John 16, 24. Hitherto hath he asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive. The Lord's Prayer is a most comprehensive uh, rendering to protect or to bring a complete care for the Christian. And the Lord wants us to learn it well. The apostolic church was fervent in prayer the church that was that is throughout church history that were uh, majoring spending time on their knees to pray have this close relationship with God and we see in church history whenever God's people are serious about prayer there will be revival in their lives and in the lives of the church. Prayer is the breath of life of an awakened soul. If you are a child of God, how do you know that you are a child of God? Well, the greatest evidence of God's children that he is in communion with his Lord. And how do you know that you are spiritually alive, we say? You breathe. You can hear your breath. A baby that is born, you know that the baby is alive and kicking because the baby was born crying. And you will hear the, the sound of the baby. You know that he's, he's alive. The same for the Christian. The Christian that is alive prays. When the Apostle Paul was first converted, Jesus asked the man Ananias to go to the house in the street called Straight to look for this man, the Saul of Tarsus. And Jesus asked him to identify this man. Behold, he 
prayers. Acts 9 verse 11. That's how a, a saint, a man of God, is identified. He has this life with God. Why did Jesus have to teach the Lord's Prayer to the people of God? Well, it was because during that time, the people of Israel have departed from the Lord. They don't know the way to God. You recall the man, Nicodemus, he was a ruler of the Jews and he had to come to Jesus by night. To ask Jesus how to be a Christian, how to be connected with God. And Jesus says, ye must be born again. There was a blindness in Israel and God in the fullness of time had to send his own son. God himself had to come in order to show us the way. Like the words of the prophet Isaiah during the time of Israel's uh, departure, he says this, but, as, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy wrecks. With we, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Our sins are consuming us and we are living the way of death. And the observation that was given there is this, there is none that calleth upon the name of the Lord, that stirred up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us. You know, when we choose to walk away from God, right, it's a devastating thing to our spiritual life. And how the Lord says it has consumed us because of our iniquities. The word iniquity is another word for sin. It means a bending, a crookedness of life. Uh, um, the Lord wants us to come back to Him. And the Lord tells us right, how we can do so. How did you first become a Christian? Well, you first pray to God, right? asking God to save you. Right? As you come with a contrite heart in repentance before God, you said, Lord Jesus, save me. That could be your first prayer. Lord, I cannot order my own life anymore. If you don't come and show me, I'm at a loss. The Lord's Prayer provides for us eight pertinent elements. Eight pertinent elements that we want to take time to study and focus on. When you visit Israel, we were there uh, once in 1998, and uh, this is the place that is called the Church of Pastor Noster, right? the Church of Our Father. That's the meaning of the word um, Pater Noster. And there, uh, in the Mount of Olives, stands this church that has the Word of God, the Lord's Prayer, printed, engraved on the wall in, with 64 languages. Uh, There's a picture of that church there. And I recall uh, it was the first time I could take long leave since starting work five years uh, to be able to go. And I thank my department manager for giving me the leave almost two weeks. And coming back, well, I brought a copy of the Lord's Prayer in his own language. There are many different uh, expressions of the Lord's Prayer 
in the vernacular language of God's people. And the Lord wants us to know and learn how to commune with Him. And so, these are the eight pertinent elements of prayer that we want to bring to you. And we have uh, used the alphabet P to help us to uh, 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 grasp uh, is more easily. Right. Preface, praise, preach, power, provision, pardon, protection, and praise. Our Father, we shout in heaven. The first words of the Lord's Prayer tells us that we are not orphans on earth, but that we have a heavenly Father who takes care of us. And, you know, we have our earthly Father who would do good to His children. But the Lord says here that you have a heavenly Father who is infinitely more powerful, who will be able to help you. And so the address in the Lord's Prayer begin with the address of God himself. How do we approach God? Well, it is to the Father which is in heaven. And today in our newsletter, we have uh, continued uh, the life of Martin Luther. And there, we said that one of the most uh, popular of his writings that has impacted the church since the Reformation is his catechism. And this is his small catechism where he wrote in order to instruct the people of God and on this part on the Lord's Prayer he says this our God is our true father and we are his true children so that we may have all boldness and confidence ask him as dear children ask their dear father Right, we have said before, why is it that God put us into families? Right? Uh, have you wondered why is it that you, uh, uh, you have a father and that God uh, in the fullness of time enable you to have children? You learn by this familiar relationship, our relationship with the Father in heaven, which is spiritual, which is eternal. Right? But by a physical uh, understanding, when God put us into families, right, we learn that relationship between a father and a child. And so that in eternity, this will be our relationship. We, his children in eternity, with our father in heaven. And here on earth, we learn this lesson well and so the lord's prayer begin with these words our father which art in heaven we acknowledge right, that we have a father who is beyond this universe he is in heaven high above exalted and we are his children and we are coming before him and how do we come before him and jesus says hallowed be thy name well we come before him because he has brought us to him through his son jesus christ and the word there hallowed means to be made holy how can you draw close to God? Well, because God has made you holy through the blood of His Son, 
Jesus Christ. So the Lord's Prayer has a story to tell. And that's what we want to learn. What is it that God wants us to commune with Him? And it's a very logical story that is unfolding before us. And we want us to think and consider very carefully right? the name of God. Hallowed be thy name. We'll be going through the details of it in the coming weeks. But here we say that God has made us holy. We are by this prayer acknowledging God for who He is, worthy of our worship and praise. Why is the Father worthy of our praise? Because He has cleansed us from all our sins. We are able to say by the Spirit of God that is within us, in us, to say no to sin, to have that power, that freedom over sin and death. And that when you take your last breath, do you know where you would go? Absent in the body, present with the Lord. But that is the first thought that is before us. Praise, hallowed be thy name. A happy beginning because of what God had done for you. So this first petition is an affirmation that this most high God has condescended to be among his people. And God's name signifies his character, signifies his reputation, represents who he is, his worth. He is a thrice holy God. You remember Isaiah? When he was in the throne room of God, right, he was freezing there, Isaiah chapter 6. Right? He saw the glory of God and he remembered how the king Uzziah died. Right? He, was died he died a leper because he intruded into the throne room of God to offer sacrifices. Only the priests is appointed by God for that and in his pride this great king that has brought great prosperity and wealth to Israel in his pride he intruded into the throne room of God and God immediately struck him with leprosy and he died of leprosy we have a holy God a God who is a consuming fire a judge and he has saved you. You are clean before him. His blood has washed you white as snow. And this is your privilege that God has given to you. We said that Christianity is a relationship, a relationship between God and men. And sin is a broken relationship. But through Jesus Christ, this relationship is mended when you receive Jesus Christ believe that he has died for your sins shed his blood to wash every wit clean and three days later he triumphed over death and sin by his resurrection from the dead that is the power of holiness that is given to God's people and so he says here hallowed be thy name praise very happy why because of what God had done for us so we proclaim his merit we proclaim his worth it is man's most worthy and reverential acknowledgement of God this is how we can address God hallowed be thy name and we can never really fathom what it means to praise the name of God, those words uh, that are being articulated by our Lord Jesus Christ. And it takes time to dwell, to think, to consider, to dwell deeply. There was a, a pastor right, who spent his whole life in the study of God's word and the uh, Lord's prayer. 
was one of those that he has taken so much time to consider and to learn to pray and to seek to know and at the end of it he said that wow it is so deep so deep I could not still after a lifetime of rendering see the depths of that relationship that I can have with my heavenly father and so it begins like this and then it tells us that the next petition there preface that's how we begin the prayer addressing God who is our father in heaven and that's how we pray to the father through the son and by the help of the Holy Spirit our Father which art in heaven and praise hallowed be thy name and then the, the Lord Jesus says thy kingdom come and we use the word preach and then we want to share the story of the message that God has for us uh, the fact that we can be made holy must cause us to want to share this good news with others having benefited received sins forgiven having a life worth living what the Lord wants us to do is to share the source of our blessing with others thy kingdom come and here when Jesus speaks those words, this is the shortest part, shortest petition in the Lord's Prayer. Only three words, four words in the original. But it is impactful. God's kingdom speaks about his dominion, his rule, and his reign. Sometimes we think eh, God is invisible. Where is he as we go through the troubles of life? You see the world, you know, as it were, veering off course. You'll see families veering off course. Husband and wife in their relationship veering off course. Indeed, we live in a, a generation where uh, we, we truly need God. Families are breaking down. And in America, the statistics, 50% divorce rates. In Europe, 70%. Families are crying out, what to do? Well, here, Jesus says, thy kingdom come. God must usher in his kingdom. You know why, um, you know, when Israel begin their life as a nation, they were called a theocracy. God rules. And when you have God ruling, that's the best. But in, since the fall of mankind, right, you find that uh, man has uh, rejected the rule of God in their lives. And so when you think of this prayer, that God's kingdom may be inaugurated. God's kingdom may come. God's kingdom may have its, the word there is parousia, the second coming of the Lord, that Christ must come to make right. Men sought to rule last 6,000 years and he has failed miserably. If you look at the history of mankind, there were perhaps only 300 years that were without war. Right? All the other time, men were savagely killing one another. Right? And the only time when they were not at war is when they were preparing for the next war. They were reload, reloading. So as you think about mankind and our life, the world it is, and how we attempt to... Uh, bring things in order right? we see that ah, there is great disorder and so this prayer uh, thy kingdom come is so important 
Do you pray with a larger perspective? Do you pray for the persecuted saints that is around the world? Do you have that big picture of what God is doing in His kingdom work? Well, here you see the Lord's Prayer begins with that big picture. He doesn't begin with saying, give us this day our daily bread. But he begins by speaking about his kingdom. He's telling us to live with a higher purpose. He wants us to know, to see that there, are, there is a higher purpose and meaning to life. When God made Israel, when they were in the wilderness, we were studying Ex, uh, Exodus chapter 17, no water again. What did they do? Well, they were murmuring. But what was God doing? God was making with them a nation. And God said to them, Exodus 17, 7, Am I not with you? If I am with you, can I not take care of you? What did God do? Well, God asked his servant Moses to take a rod, hit a stone, and water came out of the stone. We have a God who is indeed able to help us. God save you for a purpose. It's not just to put food on the table. No. God has a greater purpose for his kingdom. That's why he sent his son. And that his son has given to us the marching orders, the great commission to preach, thy kingdom come. Our Lord Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then the end shall come. Right? Today, we believe that we, there is that possibility. Right? As we speak here, men and women across the globe are listening in to us. We have Technology has enabled us that the gospel can be preached to the end. And the Lord tells us that it means that his kingdom is consummating. He's coming again. And the Lord wants us to live for that higher purpose because when he comes, he will bring his reward with him. What have you done with your life? What are you doing with your life? Is there anything that you have done that is not called wood, hay and stubble that will be burned away? Do you have some fruit that you want to bring from eternal life? Gold, silver and precious stones that you can offer and bring before the Lord when you meet Him. Preach! Be a blessing! How can you be involved in the gospel work, the kingdom work? You may not be standing, giving the word as it is, but God gives you a tract. Ask you to talk to someone, someone who is connected to you. Someone God will bring your way. Would you have the heart to do something? Well, as parents, we said our greatest uh, ministry is to be pastors to our own children. To minister to them, to teach them the things of God, that they may know God. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This third petition acknowledges the sovereignty of God. He rules over all in heaven and in earth. There is no power or there are no powers that is not subjected to the almighty power of God. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we find that this is a difficult prayer to utter in a sense that if we sense that our will is in conflict with God's will, there seems to be a fear in our heart to turn 
over control of our lives to God. Right? We think and we calculate in our mind and say, hey, we lose out. Thy will be done. But we don't want God's will in certain areas of our life. We don't want God's will. But here, it is said to us that we are to pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That the will of God cannot be thwarted. This is a prayer of submission to the divine rule of God in our lives. Well, you have your devotion, you read the word of God. And the Lord speaks to you through his Holy Spirit and tells you that this is what you are to do. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How can it be done on earth? Well, it begins with our life. And we take that effort to live for the Lord. The higher purpose that God has for our lives. And it is a reminder for us to have a heart of discernment. To know the purpose of God for our lives and to seek it. Do you know the purpose of God in your life? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. Your will be done in my life. Do you ask yourself this question? So this Lord's Prayer helps us to search our hearts that we may know what is the will of God for our lives. And basically, it is a prayer of surrender to God. And it's difficult, right? Very difficult. Many areas of our life we don't want to be it to be surrendered to God and so the first three parts the first three aspects of the Lord's Prayer are summed up by the first part of uh, Matthew 6 33 Jesus says but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness so he instruct us that we are to direct our attention to God the Father we are to pray to the Father that his name be hallowed and that his kingdom come and that his will will be done. And Israel had to learn that lesson while they were in the wilderness. Why? Because God is going to bring them to the promised land and God is going to bring them to the land that is flowing with milk and honey. They are going to be so well clothed that they have everything that they would ever need in their life and they are going to forget the Lord because it is when they were in the promised land that they were secured in the land of plenty that they went a whoring after other gods. And that's where the Lord finally had to deport them out of the land. Suddenly, drought came. Suddenly, famine came. Suddenly, trouble came. And so the Lord wants us to understand the higher purpose for our life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Israel was a witness for God to all the nations of the world. Israel has departed from the Lord. Last 2,000 years, Israel was not in the land. God brought them back. 1948, May the 14th. And the Lord wants us to see that God does not forsake his own, but he has a purpose for his people. And we, the church of Jesus Christ, is raised of God as his witnesses in the last days, in the end times. And this is the purpose for our congregating, why we come together, why we worship God, why we recite the Lord's Prayer, so that we may know the purpose of our existence and we may be living our lives to the fullest. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Provision, preface, praise, preach. Power, provision. Give us this day our daily bread. When Israel was in the wilderness, first, you know, they faced national crisis. First, no water after three days. Then, no food. National crisis. God brought manna in the morning and quails in the night. God provided for them. Would God not provide for you? Of course, God will provide for you. Right, we were studying Exodus 17, 7, uh, verse 1. It says, Israel was journeying from the wilderness of sin to Rephidim. By according to the commandment of God, they were doing the will of God. If you are following the Lord, walking with God, doing His will, will He not take care of you? Of course He will take care of you. No questions asked. When they ask for water, they got water. Right? God asked Moses to take a, take a piece of wood, throw into the bitter water, and the bitter water became sweet. Will God not take care of you? Of course, God will take care of you. Give us this day our daily bread. But we must not take for granted. Right? Israel was asked to go and pick up the manna six days a week. On the seventh day, take two portions. Because the seventh day, the seventh day is the day of rest. And the Lord wanted his people to rest on the seventh day. So that's to to worship him, to remember what he had done for them. And so you want to, we want to notice the priority, the order of priority in the mind of God. And we must have that same order of priority too. Right? Oftentimes our priorities are upside down. We don't seek first the kingdom of God. Right? No wonder during the time of uh, Haggai, when Israel returned to the land, uh, they were frantically building their own house. They forgot the Lord. And the Lord said that you, you do all these things and you receive what you have into a pocket filled with holes. Somehow not filled. Because we have, not, we have forgotten the Lord. And this was the lesson that Israel had to learn. And the prophet Haggai was uh, sent by the Lord in order to jot the people. He says that the house of God is laying in waste. What are you doing? Building your own houses? When your spiritual life is thriving and is strong, of course, all these things will be added unto you. And so you see there is an order that the Lord wants us to know. And he wants us to follow. And we must always acknowledge him first. It is a rightful attitude because we are creatures of God's creation. The <clears throat> pot in the potter's hand is subject to the pleasure of the divine potter. If you think of it, oh, a bit uh, scary, right? Yeah. But if you follow the Lord, walk with him, Will he do you good? He will always do you good. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us the bread of our necessity. The bread that suffices for each day. It is a prayer for God to take care of our physical needs. May our Heavenly Father supply and furnish our needs. The bread that we need. Do give us today and day after day. Day. Well, this is more than just meeting our physical needs. This is a prayer acknowledging that God is the sustainer of our physical well being. I remember the disciples, they went out fishing and they caught a whole nothing. And the Lord says, at Launch out into the deep. Uh, Luke 5, verse 7. And they launch out and they, what did they do? 
Well, they caught a whole net full. All the fishes swam into the net, whereas the night before, all the fishes swam away from the net. But this is the God that we serve. Provision, pardon, and give us this day and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here, right, the focus is on God's care for our past. Right? Provision, give us this day our daily need is God's care for our present. But give us, forgive us our debts is focusing upon God's care for our past where we have done wrong in the sight of God. Forgive us our debts. And it's an urgent, imperative prayer. Do you pray this prayer? Lord, forgive me for what I've done wrong. Search my heart so that I may know if there's any iniquity in me, that you may forgive it. Forgive me. Uh, this petition uh, that is given is most crucial. Right? To have peace in our heart. Right? God must forgive us of our sins. Sins can eat us up. When we have unconfessed sins in our life, well, it causes us no amount of misery. But when we come to God and ask for pardon, right, you find that uh, your, God's peace will come to your heart again. God's joy will come to your heart again. Psalm 37 verse 2 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. The seventh petition. Protection. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do you pray this prayer? That God would protect you from a temptations that would come in the day, well, we pray this prayer every day as a family. Why? Because we know that we are weak in the flesh. We can fall any time. And therefore, we ask that the Lord would lead us not into temptation. Protect us from every temptation. You make a way of escape that I may have the strength of heart to say no to sin. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one, the attack of the evil one. We are weak, but God is strong. Do you ask God to protect you daily? Luther said, God indeed tempts no one. But we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world and our flesh may not deceive us nor seduce us into mischief, despair and other great shame and vice. And though we may we be assailed by them, that still we may finally overcome and obtain the victory. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And Luther further wrote, We pray in this petition, as the sum of all, that our Father in heaven would deliver us from every evil body and soul, property and honour, and finally, when our last hour has come, grant us a blessed end and, a gener and generously take us from this veil of tears to himself in heaven. Right? A very appropriate way of describing life, isn't it? And it's not always a bed of roses. Oftentimes, 
in veils of veil of tears. God be gracious to protect us. Well, this is a picture that describes for us that we are living in Satan's world, satanic rule on earth during this time of the church age and that Christ has to come to make right all things and we say right, that we are here this is a picture of uh, Daniel Daniel chapter 2 the figure of Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7 uh, and we said that we are in the Rome Roman Empire going to the revived Roman Empire the ten horns the ten kings that is going to arise and then Christ's kingdom will come Christ will return to rule on earth for a thousand years and the Lord wants us to know that we are in this battle we are in a battlefield and what do you do when you are in battle? Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. And he says, pray with all prayer and supplication. How do you pray with all prayer and supplication? How do you make sure that your Christian life is wholesome? Well, it begin on your knees. Begin in prayer, asking the Lord to show you how you are to live your life. And the Lord's prayer provide for us this comprehensive total care that we need to think about look at seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you Preface, praise, preach, power, provision, pardon, protection. Finally, it begins with praise, it ends with praise. Or pronouncement, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. We don't know, we don't understand right, um, what it is. To have God to rule. That would be the best. Because God would rule with his perfect character. God's rule. And God is returning. Christ is returning. And he's going to rule the world for a thousand years. On earth. And we are going to reign with Christ. Christ human history of last 6,000 years teaches us that we are undone that we cannot there is evil that is within us and the curtailing of that evil is by the spirit of God the power that God would endure his people who are on their knees who would pray and the Lord wants you to, to pray the Lord wants you to be protected the Lord wants you to be strong spiritually and the Lord wants you to to protect you so that you would receive uh, uh, the blessings of the life that God had meant for you to live when he had saved you. So, the shorter catechism uh, tells us, okay, I give to you here as we close. The whole word of God is of use to direct us in prayer. But the special rule of direction is that form of prayer which Christ taught his disciples, commonly called the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord wants us to 
learn well, know well, uh, Jesus, the Son of God, God himself. Of course, he will know how to teach us how to pray. He provides us the perfect example. So we have seen how the Lord's Prayer is an all-encompassing prayer that gives a total coverage, gives total coverage to our well-being with individual principles that we can apply by seeking God in all these areas of our life. And we are to make an evaluation. If we have missed out upon God's blessing in omitting to pray certain aspects of the Lord's Prayer, may God help us to fortify these weaknesses. May we make time and take time to commune with God. With it comes the blessings of peace and joy. We are not to miss out on God's blessings for us. May God speed us along to a greater communion and fellowship with Him. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Thank Thee for showing us the pattern for prayer. And Lord, as we would dwell more in depth into the Lord's Prayer in the coming weeks, may Thou be gracious to bless our study that our prayer life indeed may be rich and our Christian life, our life with Thee uh, may be rich, that that richness may uh, permeate into the lives of the people around us. This I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.